So I wanted to welcome everyone tonight uh, for one of the first nights for the Hawaii Book and Music Festival. We have a really interesting panel tonight um, and an interesting topic that I hope you all will enjoy. Uh, and I'm lucky enough to bring to you some of my um, very esteemed colleagues that I get to call um, partners in the work uh, addressing homelessness here on Oahu. Uh, and tonight we're really focusing on wellness a unified approach to homelessness. And this is very, um, uh, you know, uh, this is a very important topic at this point when we've all been living through the pandemic over the last two, almost two years now uh, and really uh, looking at how we can address uh, a long time issue in our community that of homelessness in a new light uh, and that being COVID. Um, and so tonight we're gonna be looking at how COVID has impacted and um, caused implications uh, addressing the issue of homelessness and uh, whether or not there's some silver linings in um, some of the things that have been going on over the last year and a half. Uh, we'll also be looking at um, some of the programs that have come up um, with COVID uh, uh, with some extra monies that have been coming into our state um, and addressing some of those through the behavioral health system and through HPD. And so uh, my name is Laura Thielen and I'm the executive director of Partners in Care. Simplest way to think about what we do at Partners in Care is we're a support organization for all those who provide homeless services and housing to folks who are experiencing homelessness on Oahu. I am part of our continuum of care and um, with us, we have some really great speakers. So throughout this conversation, please feel free to um, put any questions into the chat and we will uh, address, us, address those questions as we go through this hour long talk. Um, this is a conversation, not a um, lecture. Uh, it's, so hopefully you will join in and uh, give us your thoughts, ideas, your concerns, uh, and help us mold what the future will look like in addressing homelessness. So to start us off, we've got Connie Mitchell, as many of you probably know Connie. She runs the IHS, the Institute for Human Services, emergency shelter, the biggest uh, emergency shelter on Oahu. But IHS is so much more than just the shelter at Sumner Street. Uh, that they have a men's shelter on Sumner Street, a women and family shelter over on Kaahi Street. They have Tutu Birds, which really focuses on medical folks who need to come out of the hospitals and don't have anywhere to go. And they have outreach and so much more. So Connie is a vital part of our continuum of care and we really appreciate having her here. Next, we have Scott Morishige. And Scott is from the governor's office. He's the uh, governor's coordinator on homelessness. And he has a long history of working with folks within our community, uh, at, both at Helping Hands, um, at Focus, and now at the governor's office. So welcome to Scott. He's been a great advocate for those who are experiencing homelessness in our community. And then lastly, we have Acting Lieutenant Joseph Dan O'Neill. We all call him Dan. Uh, he is with the Honolulu Police Department. And despite what some think, we are great partners with our Honolulu Police Department. Uh, and we have forged a lot of great partnerships and programs along the way. And during COVID, it's been especially important that we uh, both grow that partnership and make it as good as it possibly can be because uh, we can make it a win-win situation with our folks if we keep them out of jail and keep, get them into housing. And so Dan will specifically be focusing tonight on the HONU program. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, there's definitely been some ups and downs over the last couple of years. Um, but we'll go ahead and get started. And so I am going to toss it over to Connie. Connie's going to share a couple of uh, slides for us and talk a little bit about the continuum of care in our community. Thanks, Laura. Um, I think I just wanted to start by saying that um, as a service provider, one of many on Oahu, um, I can't remember how many membership uh, we have in the Partners in Care, Laura, maybe you can kind of help us with that number, but- Probably about many, 64. Right, you know, so there's so many people who have come together to really look at the problem of homelessness. And when we talk about a unified approach, 
sometimes it's kind of challenging. So I just wanted to share with you, you know, we're in this service continuum, this um, yellow circle. And as um, Laura mentioned, there's like 60 plus service providers. And then there's other people that um, also may not be members of Partners in Care, but also do things, you know, they're from the faith communities or they're doing outreach, you know, of their own. And then, um, you know, we're embedded in this community of policymakers and then also the general public. And within our continuum, there's all different types of services. You know, um, we kind of start here with the engagement or outreach and the outreach comes in a lot of different forms. Um, you know, there are many outreach teams that are assigned to different regions of the island. There's also different types of outreach going on. Some particularly um, with people with medical needs, you know, street medicine is one of those types of um, outreach where people are really getting wound care right on the street. Um, we, we have mental health outreach specifically for people who are impaired um, by their illnesses. And then there's other outreach you know, um, that is really focused on housing navigation or just rehousing people or getting them into shelter and then into housing. So there's you know, other things going on also. And then we have case management, just providing the supports that people need, connecting them with the services um, that they require to get out of homelessness. Data management is another thing we do together with partners in care. They have the management of information system for all of homelessness, but each of the service providers that are contracted by the state or the city are required to put information into that system. And then we have um, you know, stabilization services. And these are the treatment services that really help people um, you know, just be healthier and be able to get into housing and stay in housing. We have employment support to increase income and also give people purpose and you know, um, like a sense of direction in their lives. And of course, the housing placement services actually get them into housing. And we have other supportive services which come actually right after um, outreach usually, which is to provide emergency shelter or the basic needs like meals or like a place to have um, their hygiene needs met. So um, many, many different organizations and doing all different things. And then we're in the middle of a lot of other people telling us what to do. No, um, they're actually really partners with us, but you can see that there might be a lot of different perspectives from the government and also from private foundations. Um, so if you look at this slide, like um, this and this particular week, I'm going to be speaking at a neighborhood board, you know, down in downtown Chinatown. And, um, you know, we often go and talk to the city council about you know, things that are maybe good policy or not good policy. You know, speaking with the judiciary to change the way that people are um, brought through the system so that we can get the outcomes that we want so we can actually treat people more um, quickly and you know, uh, more effectively. But if you look around all of these different agencies of the state and of the city, the city uh, county of Honolulu um, is uh, includes the police, um, actually EMS should be in here also, um, the Department of Community Services, um, the Department of Planning and Permitting, and their housing department, which also includes homelessness. Yeah, thank you, Laura. And I, I just wanted to share um, you know, a couple slides. I think Connie did a really good job of talking about the unified approach that we had to take, but I found it's um, very helpful to show pictures, because I think a picture is worth a thousand words. And um, I want to start with this picture. This is from a coordinated outreach event that happened just a couple months ago in June. I think it shows the many different players that have came together during the pandemic. So in this picture, we have you know um, HPD officers in plain clothes. We have nurses. We have homeless outreach providers. We have mental health providers. We have staff from my office and staff from the city and county as well. So I think it shows how everybody really had to step up and our providers, what a lot of people um, you know, may not realize is our homeless service providers were very much frontline providers during the whole pandemic, those in shelters and those doing outreach, just as much as our hospital workers are frontline providers. And I think um, that's just something I wanted to really kind of show how our community came together. And, in part, one of the biggest challenges, um, like Laura and others have shared, is we really had to go out and make sure that we had, could make testing available and vaccination available to the population that we serve. And what um, 
I think many people sometimes forget is the pandemic as difficult as it was for those of us with homes, for people who do not have a place to stay. It was really um, just such a drastic change to their lifestyle and, and just well-being. Um, I remember after the lockdown um, took place, I was speaking to some of the individuals that I would see who, who are homeless outside the state capital where I work. And they were telling me just how difficult it was because all the places they would go to hang out during the day, like the library or McDonald's, places they would go just to you know socialize or to get in um, outside from the hot sun, those places were shut down. Um, a lot of people were cut off from having places to use the bathroom, to charge their phone. And so we work really quickly, not only to um, have coordinated efforts to increase vaccination and testing, such as what's shown in these pictures here, but in the early days of the pandemic, we at the state convened a lot of meetings. Well, how do we open our restroom facilities? City and county did the same. And we partnered together with community groups we had never partnered with before to be able to see how could we continue to make some of those public facilities accessible. Um, in particular though, the vaccination and testing efforts more recently have been really key because what some of us um, take for granted is, you know, um, getting vaccinated for someone experiencing homelessness is not as easy as it may be for some of the others of us because a lot of times what's required for you to get a vaccination is having photo ID and many of the population we work with do not have that or they may not be able to have a car and go through a drive through clinic. So we work with partners such as Project Vision Hawaii, um, the UH Home Project and others who really went all of their way to make sure these services are accessible. And then we um, got together and would have weekly meetings with outreach to target where vaccination testing may be needed and how we could respond to emerging needs during the pandemic. I know we've had a bunch of different meetings, webinars, and various forums to share information. And I think those were really key because as Laura mentioned, things are changing um, on a day-to-day -day basis. But throughout all of this, we really wanted to keep a focus on uh, making sure people had access to shelter and housing as well. The other thing I, I really wanna emphasize is the providers and particularly partners in care organizations like IHS and others really kept the focus on housing um, despite the pandemic and despite the many challenges and placements into permanent housing continued despite COVID-19. So what I'm showing on the screen here is a dashboard that can be found on Partners in Care's website, partnersincareoahu.org. Um, and it shows, this is an initiative that started in late April and just in the you know five and a half months or so, they've been able to house 203 households, over 533 individuals represented in those households in a very short amount of time, many people being housed in just 15 to 16 days, and they're making that data um, you know, transparent and accessible in real time. Our ability, um, you know, programs like this that house people rapidly leverage federal resources that are coming in to our community, some, some for the first time. We have a really unprecedented level of federal funding now available, including emergency housing vouchers, increased funding to the CARES Act, the American Rescue Plan Act, and we're putting that funding into action through programs like this. And one of the unique things about Oahu Housing Now is not the effort of just one provider, it's a hui of different providers and our whole system really coming together making sure we can take a unified sort of centralized approach to how we house people. And it's not only resulting in more people being housed, but it's also modeling a way that we can continue to house people more quickly, moving forward even past the pandemic. And I wanted to um, just kind of close by showing some examples from across the state. Again, really show beyond just the outreaches, beyond just numbers on the dashboard, how the community did come together to respond and meet the um, many challenges we faced during the pandemic. The first picture on the left is of Halahanakahi. That's a tiny home structure, um, tiny home shelter community that came up in Hilo on the Big Island. And you know, the Big Island, just like many other parts of our state, they were experiencing reduced um, shelter bed capacity and they needed to figure out how do they address that really quickly. There were some people that were able to partner with hotels and put them in temporarily in hotels, 
But for others, they had members of the community come over um, together during one weekend, the fire department, service providers, um, other government workers, and they assembled these tiny homes from scratch and it added increased capacity in their community. Here on Oahu, we're very grateful for the partnership of you know, Lieutenant O'Neill and HPD to really look at how do you innovate, how do you take a program like the HONU, which had just launched a few months before the pandemic, and really be flexible and um, design it in a way that could be easily scalable during the early days of COVID-19. So switching from these large um, kind of um, tents that would house multiple people at one time to an individual tent model and really trying to figure out how do you provide space so people could isolate and quarantine and keep the program flexible. Um, that's the picture on the upper right. And on the bottom right is uh, one of our newest housing projects, which we're hoping to open um, possibly later this month. And this is the Kamaoku Kohale project. This is a project out in Kalailoa, Barbers Point, that our Lieutenant Governor, Homemade Hawaii, many other partners came together to build during the pandemic. And this is gonna add 36 additional units, permanent housing units for people um, to transition from homelessness into these homes. So we're continuing to keep the focus on permanent housing in many ways, not only through initiatives like Oahu Housing Now, but continuing despite everything going on to also try to add new inventory at the same time. So I know um, many of you probably have many questions. Um, I hope I didn't kind of go over my time, but if anybody wants to follow up, you can either ask your question here or just reach out to me um, at any time. And my information is here on the screen. Hello, good evening, everyone. I'm so glad to be here. I'm um, Acting Lieutenant Joseph O'Neill, the Community Outreach Unit. So I'm going to briefly discuss uh, the HONU program, some of the thought behind it, and then how it's currently operating during the pandemic. But I wanted to start by stressing that the HONU program would not have been possible without the generosity of Scott Morshige and taking a chance on a homegrown program that had no playbook, hadn't been done anywhere else. Providers such as IHS, Connie, um, Laura, Pick, and many of our partners that have given their time and effort into HONU, because HONU really is a community program. So what it stands for is the Homeless Outreach and Navigation for the Unsheltered. The program was born out of the idea, um, it was myself and I'm, I'm sure some of you know him, uh, Major Mike Lambert. We realized there was a problem, not just the way that police approached our unsheltered members of the community, but in the amount of diversion and that enforcement cannot solve the problem of homelessness. HPD takes, um, I think, about a million calls for service a year, and a large portion of those is uh, our, our non-emergency. So, and a huge percentage of those are related to things the community see as uh, nuisance complaints. Maybe it's an unsheltered member of the community sleeping at a bus stop, or a homeless person. Uh, for each of these encounters, that's an opportunity that a police officer could offer a more permanent solution into something. So the idea with Honu was that, you know, officers aren't ever going to be social workers or as skilled as people like Connie and Scott and Laura. But how can they not have to learn the complex system of navigation and shelters and get someone into services in the moment that they want help? So the design of Honu was that a patrol officer or even a social service provider at any time of the day could refer someone into the HONU as um, it's a think of it as a mobile um, it's a navigation center but almost like a train station to where the person referring would not have to um, or, uh, know the complexities of the shelter system they wouldn't need to worry about categories of bed space that may um, affect our brick and mortar shelters if it's an officer all they would do is ask the person do you want help? And if the person said yes, once they were transported to Honu, uh, um, civilian non-officer case management will do an intake with the person, get them into a temporary a living facility, such as an air shelter or a tent, and the person would be allowed to uh, talk to the case management person about where would be the best fit for them, what part of the community they could return to and have the best result. But HONU was designed as just the catch-all. So it wouldn't matter if it's midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m. All a person needed to do was say, I want help. They could come to the HONU, HONU facility and then go on to the more permanent programs such as um, facilities like IHS or the things that Scott was showing. Um, during the pandemic, we realized that uh, we still wanted to offer 
this 24 hour service, but we dealt with the complex, complex challenge of social distancing and creating safety for the people that wanted to come into Honu. And that's where the picture that Scott showed with the tents was we had to alter the model to where people could still come into the Honu 24 hours a day, but we had structured social distancing. This was still all voluntary. The Honu was, um, anyone was free to leave at any point in time, but we realized that it had to be low barrier and we had to have a place that our homeless members of the community could feel safe, just like our house members. Because when you have a stay at home order, it's, um, it's not really fair to the house members of the public if, say, a police officer doesn't enforce a mask rule or a park closure on the unsheltered members, but then they enforce a rule on the sheltered members of the community. So we wanted to have this option as well to where someone would have a place if they wanted to receive safety. Um, the HONU program has operated uh, in a pandemic mode since April of last year. And uh, during that time, we knew that sometimes the community, um, there's that sense a lot of times of not in my backyard. So new initiatives and programs, uh, brick and mortar shelters, they get a lot of pushback. So we knew we wanted to be environmentally, environmentally conscious, not have a permanent effect on any one community. We called it the shared burden model. So we realized also through outreach that in an area like Wahiwa or Waimanalo, the people from that area, it's not really reasonable to tell a homeless encampment that you must pick up and move to town or else you're going to face enforcement. So we designed it as mobile to where we could deploy into an area of need very quickly. These shelters that you see on the screen, they can be deployed in about four minutes. They're, the frames are airframes and they, they reflect 60% of the heat and they can withstand 75 miles an hour in a wind. So it's a very robust structure as far as like, you know, glorified camping. It's very, very cool. It's, um, uh, it's actually pretty comfortable. We've never had any complaints about staying in there, but the point of the mobility was that how can we launch this thing within hours? And then if, say, if we had uh, a family that wanted help at 1 a.m. or a single male, single female, any category you can think of, we could launch another structure within minutes and accommodate that, um, that category.